The last speaker in this uh, conference is uh, Keith Moffat, who did his PhD with George Batchelor um, and edited JFM for 20 odd years and uh, also succeeded George Batchelor as head of uh, the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics, which George Batchelor founded. So very much um, all due to George. Keith. Well, thank you very much, John. And uh, may I say how much I've enjoyed the uh, lectures we've heard in the last three days now. And of course, the one from Howard that, that we just heard reminds me particularly of the time that he came to Cambridge. I think it was 19, early 1970s, perhaps 71, 72 around then um, for I think a year. It was a wonderful time. It was when George Batchelor had quite recently taken up microhydrodynamics, almost invented the subject in his own way. And um, so it was the second phase of his very brilliant career. It was a time when our chairman, uh, John Hinch, uh, was a research student of George. And uh, <clears throat> Gary Leal, as uh, Howard has says, said, was, I think, a a postdoc visiting uh, Cambridge, uh, also visiting DAMTP during that year. So it was a very exciting year. And I remember, remember how we met in the common room of DAMTP for a coffee <coughs> every morning. Very, very important. One of the most important events of the day was the break for coffee, um, because that's when research problems were discussed in a very informal way. And we used to scribble on the coffee tables that were made for that purpose. Um, and uh, it's a pity we didn't take photographs of all the ideas that were recorded in that way at that time. Anyway, lovely memories. But I, I'm going to go back a bit earlier in my uh, talk. I became um, um, a student of George. Uh, let me see next. Oh, um, I'm afraid my next is not working. Let me try. And, uh, for some reason, my. Hmm, let me escape. Look on the screen, Keith, to bring it back. Bring your cursor over the screen and then try again. My cursor is on the screen um, and I'm pressing N for next. I don't know why it's not uh, moving to the next one. Oh, dear. Uh, and I can't escape either. So what has gone wrong? Um, oh, well, it's gone to the next one. That's all right, somehow. <laughs> Here's my next slide. Are you seeing a, a photograph of George in his little office at the old Cavendish Laboratory? This was in 1956, <clears throat> just after publication of the first issue of the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. And it was where, two years later, I met George. I went to this little office. It was extremely cramped and full of books and papers. You could hardly open the door. Um, I asked George if he would take me on as a research student in turbulence, a subject in which he was already the world leader. This was a bit presumptuous of me, um, but to my delight, he said yes. And he said it on the basis of my degree in mathematical sciences from Edinburgh University, which I think perhaps chimed with his own experience. He'd come as a graduate of Melbourne University in Australia, um, and he had asked G.I. Taylor if he would take him on as a research student in turbulence, which he did. More of this a bit later. Now, uh, there we are, go. good. Um, <clears throat> one of my most vivid memories was a trip to Poland in September 1963. <clears throat> I'd just become an assistant lecturer <clears throat> in the department, having taken my PhD the previous year. So this was with George and his family to attend the third biennial symposium on fluid mechanics. Uh, George very kindly offered uh, to take me together with his wife and uh, young family by car. I think it was an old Ford Zodiac with, you remember, three bench seats in the front and three in the back. Uh, to Zakopane in the high 
Tatra Mountains. That's where this photograph was taken on the road to Zakopane, um, uh, where the symposium was held that year. So this is George with his three daughters, Adrian, Bryony and Claire, and his wife Wilma on the right. Uh, we traveled via Holland, Germany and Czechoslovakia to Poland. Uh, it was quite an adventure in those days, uh, particularly crossing Czechoslovakia, of course, which was under Soviet <coughs> rule at the time. And um, there were virt there were no signposts, uh, so and there was no there was no satellite uh, help, of course. Um, so there was a degree of um, intuition involved, as I seem to remember, in finding our way to the Polish border. Um, <clears throat> now, George, of course, gave a lecture at that symposium, and here is the situation that he considered. Um, uh, I hope that you can see the whole screen. Um, is it is it all right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> he considered um, diffusion of a point source uh, of pollutant uh, from uh, in a boundary layer and a turbulent airflow. Uh, this being through the turbulent boundary layer. Um, his paper is published in the proceedings of that symposium. Archivum Mechaniki Stosovanich. Now I think the archives of, mechan of mechanics, um, and um, it was uh, basically a similarity solution that he provided, uh, depending only on, as by assumption, <coughs> on the stress velocity, the friction velocity u star in the turbulent boundary layer, and on time t. Uh, since release. And on that basis, uh, George found the mean concentration downstream at uh, ground level, uh, and he found that that decreases like x to the power minus two <coughs> for a continuous point source. I show here the uh, picture of the, um, the famous or notorious, if you like, volcano Eyaf Yolayokul, it's that unpronounceable name, which I do my best to pronounce, uh, which um, erupted on the 17th of April, 2010. And um, uh, it was a very serious eruption. It uh, spread ash uh, all over Europe and um, it grounded uh, planes, uh, certainly all planes going from Heathrow Airport uh, and particularly those to the United States. And uh, I think um, something like uh, 10 million uh, travelers were affected by this disaster. Um, 10 million travelers, according to the London Times. Uh, well, now according to uh, uh, Wikipedia. Um, the lower picture was actually published in the London Times two days after the eruption, 19th April, as you see. And the dark shadow, shadow shows the shape of the <coughs> ash cloud. You can see Reykjavik up here, Iceland, uh, where the erup near where the eruption occurred. Uh, here is Spain down here, so this gives you an idea of the scale. And uh, two days later, this cloud had evidently got as far as Moscow. It was an amazing, uh, extraordinary phenomenon. I couldn't help <coughs> observing that uh, the shape of the cloud, not the, not the red uh, boundary, but the actual shape of the ash cloud, um, if you look at it from the right angle, it looks very like a, a kangaroo. And I thought perhaps uh, this was 10 years after George's death, but I thought perhaps it was a sort of tribute in memoriam to him in recognition of his Australian origins. <clears throat> well, this is actually from my own paper <clears throat> presented at that same Zakopane meeting. And um, I was interested in corner flow at the time. And this was a particular model where the flow was driven by a sleeve moving over a finite segment here, 
with velocity minus uh, v and another sleeve here minus v, so generating an eddy. And the interest, of course, was to look at the asymptotic behavior <clears throat> near the corner and also the asymptotic behavior at a great distance from the corner. And um, these eddies are part of the solution near the corner, the asymptotic flow near the corner. And I remember taking this solution to George Batchelor in his office. Um, it, in, at that time, it was in um, our original site in Free School Lane, uh, part of the old Cavendish building. I took it to him anyway, and I, I was very nervous. I thought, this must be wrong. It doesn't look right. But anyway, I, I took it to George and said, this, I think, is what happens, flow near a corner. And I thought he would say, don't be ridiculous. Go away. Check your algebra. You've made a mistake. But he didn't. Uh, he said, he looked interested. And he said, you may be right. He said, you may be right. Go away and write it up. And uh, then let me see more of the detail. Um, check the algebra, yes, but uh, you may be right. And I found that immensely encouraging. And it was typical of George uh, that he would give this sort of encouragement to uh, young, much younger colleagues, um, always in a very positive and helpful way. Well, Poland, um, he had strong links with Poland through, um, particularly through Richard Herczynski, uh, who I show here on the left, and uh, Vladek Fijlin. You've seen this photograph in Patrick Uer's talk uh, yesterday, um, uh, who were both very much involved in the organization of these biennial meetings, <coughs> which ran from 1959 to 1989, and were extremely important in allowing communication, a sort of corridor of communication between East and West during the Cold War years. Um, this uh, center photo shows uh, a picture of uh, George, I would say, scheming with Vladek and with Richard at the meeting in Warsaw in 1979. Um, Richard Herczynski was imprisoned as again, I think, Howard mentioned uh, <clears throat> for a period during the Solidarność years, the 1980s, the very difficult years. And uh, George was very supportive throughout this period. So long and uh, very fruitful and friendly relationship with Pol Polish mechanics, which continued. Um, uh, George at uh, the meeting in 1983 um, met uh, Conrad Beyer, who was a young student at that time in uh, Warsaw, and uh, encouraged him to apply to do research in Cambridge. And I was very lucky to become the supervisor of uh, Conrad. Um, and he was a marvelous colleague for me. Very sadly, he died in the year 2014 at the young age of uh, um, 58, it's very tragic, but students of Conrad have continued to come to Cambridge and this link with Poland uh, still flourishes and it was all originated by Bachelor going back to very early times. Uh, Richard Herczynski spent a year in Cambridge, it was 1960, 61 I think. I, I was uh, still a research student at that time but uh, I remember well his visit and that uh, that was a, a wonderful period also in uh, in Cambridge. Um, well the other early event I want to recall is what I call the Marseille 1961 watershed and by watershed uh, as you know it means a, a critical point or a dividing line between two phases or conditions. I think for George, it was a dividing line between his uh, interest, his keen interest and involvement in turbulence and uh, a losing interest, partly because um, he found the 
subject impossibly difficult, actually, the, the dynamical uh, problem of turbines, as did everyone else at that time. Um, and partly because he got so involved in writing his book, which was to be published in 1967. And also, of course, he was extremely involved in building up DAMTP in Cambridge, which he had founded uh, and was the first head of department of in 1959. Uh, so anyway, the meeting in, in uh, the Colloque International, as it was called, in uh, uh, Marseille, 1961, was a very special occasion. Um, this picture on the upper right shows one of the excursions to um, the Roman, Ro Roman ruins at Arles. Uh, the lower one, a uh, conference dinner in which you see George with his back to the camera, deep in conversation with uh, Anna Kovazny, the wife of Leslie Kovazny, who's at the head of the table, one of the other organizers of the meeting. On the other side of the table there, you see Don Coles, who gave a brilliant lecture on uh, spiral turbulence in Taylor Kouet flow and Itirotani from Japan, who served for many years on the Bureau of Ayutam. Um, on the left, a picture of George with the legendary von Karman, who was uh, just past his 80th birthday that year, 1961, and uh, was, uh, of course, a great legend in the subject. Even uh, as a student at Edinburgh University, uh, I had learnt of the von Karman Vortex Trail, which I thought, I think, is part of every undergraduate um, syllabus in fluid mechanics. Um, well, this was a, a symposium that had a lasting impact. In fact, a 50th anniversary colloquium was held in the year 2011, uh, and the proceedings of that symposium have been published here as the reference and I think uh, if you follow the reference you find that the original um, proceedings of the 1961 symposium I have them here you can all see Colloc Mécanique de la Turbulence. Most of the papers are in English except funny enough Kolmogorov's which is in both Russian and French in this volume. Well, I'll come to that in a moment. But first, let me record uh, some of Bachelor's concluding remarks. He was responsible for the session on homogeneous turbulence at this colloquium. And uh, I just highlight three of his statements. Um, firstly, formal mathematical investigations have produced remarkably little of value. A successful theoretical work more often takes the form of simple deductions from an assumed plausible physical model of a limited aspect of the flow. I think he might still say the same today, and it reminds me very much of yesterday's beautiful lecture by Berengère de Brühl, in which she looks at very specific aspects of the flow and describes them in terms of her interacting passant. The second uh, comment of Batchelor, he says the universal similarity theory, and he's referring here to Kolmogorov's 1941 theory uh, of the small scale uh, components of the motions stand out uh, as a valuable contribution of which an increasing number of applications is being made, especially in problems involving convection and diffusion of scalar and vector properties of the fluid. He had been involved just in the years before, very much in the question of um, the spectrum of a scalar field that is um, convected and diffused by homogeneous turbulence. That was his famous 1959 paper in JFM. Well, there were two, part one and part two. I may come back to that. Um, well, Karl Magorov had pre presented his paper, his, we'll call it the refinement of previous hypotheses paper. He presented it in French, in a rather curious French, as I remember, which uh, the French had some difficulty in uh, 
comprehending. It's perhaps a little easier for the English to understand because it was uh, very Russian French. Let me just say that. Uh, he'd given his lecture the previous day. I remember it very clearly. The uh, final statement of George here is there is a need for measurement of the mean values of third and fourth powers of velocity derivatives at very high Reynolds numbers. These might throw light on the obscure and interesting question of the way in which the energy of the small scale components is distributed over the fluid. And here, of course, he is referring to intermittency, a phenomenon that he had already uh, discussed in a paper with Townsend that uh, Beranger uh, referred to yesterday, um, uh, a paper published uh, in, uh, in 1949, uh, a very famous paper to this day, the uh, really the origin of work on intermittency, which remained a major preoccupation throughout the 1960s. Um, I just want to make quick reference to a much earlier piece of work by Batchelor, <clears throat> which uh, is very little known, partly because it was a secret, as you say, secret report of CSIRO in Australia, 1942, when George uh, was um, a master, he'd taken his master's degree at the University of Melbourne, and he was employed during the war years on very practical problems. And here was one of them. I can hardly read the title myself, but uh, it is uh, on the aerial flight of a torpedo bomb by G.K. Batchelor, MSC. Um, well, this is rather fascinating because it was about the way that a bomb will, will bounce in effect on, uh, on water uh, if it comes at an appropriate angle and, uh, and so on. Um, at the same time in the UK, uh, Operation Chastise was the uh, famous dam busters attack on the German bombs, uh, dams carried out in 1943 by the Royal Air Force. Um, we associate this very much with the name of, um, well, um, Barnes Wallace. And uh, you're probably all familiar with the film, the, the famous film that was made, uh, the dam busters film. But here was George in 1942, before the, uh, before, I doubt, I don't know if there was communication, maybe by secret communication between Australia and uh, the UK while this, uh, this work was being developed, it seems quite possible. Um, well, um, as I say, uh, very much from Melbourne, and he maintained his links with Australia very strongly throughout his career. Um, scholarship to Melbourne University and graduated in maths and physics just as the war began. He had wanted to come to, to uh, Cambridge immediately to do a PhD, but it all had to be postponed during the uh, five, war, five of the war years. Um, he uh, recognized turbulence, however, as the key problem, and uh, he studied the papers of Taylor uh, from 1935 on the statistical theory. He wanted to work with the GI, wrote to him, and uh, GI uh, agreed to take him on. And um, he persuaded, it's very important, persuaded his fellow Australian, Alan Townsend, to join forces with him, come to Cambridge. Uh, Townsend was an experimentalist. Uh, Batchelor was more the theoretician, and it made an extremely powerful combination. So um, George, well, married Wilma, 1944, and they set off for England in what turned out to be an epic voyage. Ten weeks, uh, the journey via New Zealand, Panama Canal, Jamaica, New York, and then in a convoy of 90 ships across the Atlantic, arriving at Tilbury Docks, London, April 1945. There was still danger, of, great danger of torpedo attacks um, in the Atlantic during that period. This was the ship they actually traveled in as it was in 1950. It didn't, I think, last much longer than that. Well, the drama was that George found that GI didn't want to work on turbulence at all. 
uh, at that point, he'd got interested in other things, for example, blast waves um, on which he'd worked during the war uh, and other uh, war related problems. And uh, he had, in effect, himself felt, I think, that he'd done all he could on the problem of turbulence. Um, so George set to work in the basement library of the Cambridge Philosophical Society, um, which was located in the old art school in Bennett Street. And I remember that library very well. Uh, he later described how he came upon the papers of Kolmogorov, 1941. Uh, he says, like a prospector systematically going through a load of crushed rock, I suddenly came upon two short articles, each about four pages in length, whose quality was immediately clear. Well, it's quite amazing that these volumes, they are in the volumes published in Dokladi, 1941, the English version of the Soviet journal. The Russian Academy had moved from Moscow to Kazan in the Russian Urals in the face of the uh, German advance. And um, I suppose the printing was done there in Kazan, but somehow these volumes got up to Murmansk and uh, according to Baron Blatt, they were used as ballast. I mean, not only Dokladi, but volumes of every other, uh, everything else published in the Soviet Union, ballast for ships returning through the very tempestuous Norwegian Sea back to Scapa Flow in the Orkney Islands uh, of the UK. Uh, the outward journey having carried armaments and provisions for the besieged Russians. Um, well, I, I, uh, I don't know if that was Baron Blatt that tells this story. It would be very interesting to have that corroborated by serious historians who can look into any written records that remain from that period. Um, but uh, ba Baron Blatt swore to me that that, that was true. <laughs> now, um, Batchelor presented his interpretation of Kolmogorov's work and a comparison with that of Ansager Eisenberg and von Wasseker at the Paris International Congress of Mechanics in September 1946. <clears throat> Paul Germain told me that the uh, proceedings of this Congress were duly delivered to uh, Gauthier Villard, the French publisher, but have not yet appeared. And I think this must be a record in publication delay. Um, Anyway, uh, uh, George published his paper. It's one of the three papers in Nature that Howard mentioned, published in 1946. Um, and the full account, expanded account, one year later in the Proceedings of the Cambridge Philosophic Society. Of course, there was no JFM in those days. And I think that really his interpretation of the Kolmogorov theory was the basis of his worldwide reputation uh, during the uh, rest of the 40s and through the 1950s. He, um, you've seen this photograph also in uh, Howard's presentation, uh, George with uh, G.I. Taylor, his research mentor, supervisor, as we call it in Cambridge, in the Neville's Court of Trinity College on the day of his graduation with a PhD in 1948. He had been elected a Fellow of Trinity one year earlier, which is a recognition of very brilliant work. And I quote from the preface to his dissertation. He says, in general, <clears throat> this dissertation represents superstructure built on the foundation work of Sir Geoffrey Taylor on the use of statistical theory and the significance of isotropic turbulences Emphasis was on isotropic, but he also treated uh, axisymmetric turbulence, as he did also in his uh, textbook that followed. Well, here uh, was the book, The Theory of Homogeneous Turbulence. He won the Adams Prize, uh, which is one of the most distinguished prizes of Cambridge University, in 1952. And uh, then a year later, that turned into his... Uh, research monograph, actually the first in a series of Cambridge monographs in mechanics and applied mathematics, which were edited by 
George Batchelor himself and Herman Bondi. One of the, uh, I think the second or third was the famous little monograph on hydrodynamic stability by C.C. Lin. Now in uh, that book, and he was referring back to the paper I mentioned of Batchelor and Townsend, 1949. Uh, this was shown also by Beranger yesterday. And it's rather curious, this quantity uh, is a flatness factor <coughs> of a derivative, nth order derivative of the velocity in a particular direction, the direction between two probes in the, uh, in the turbulent field. And um, according to Kolmogorov's theories, this being a dimensionless number determined by the small scale features of the turbulence, it ought to be independent of Reynolds' number. But there is a very distinct increase uh, with increasing Reynolds number, and that increase becomes more marked as the order of the derivative increases n. Now, uh, Batchelor includes this in, as I say, he was very, very wedded to Kolmogorov 1941, or K41, as we now call it, theory, and as is taught in all uh, introductory courses on turbulence. But Batchelor from 1949 must have been aware uh, that this result was in rather serious conflict with K41. So even from 1949, he must have been aware of this. And I think this really must have worried him greatly. And it came to a head actually at the meeting in Marseille in uh, 1961. Um, it led to a very, in his book, um, this result led to a very preliminary discussion of two-dimensional turbulence <clears throat> and the appearance of and merging of concentrated vortices. Um, on the very last page of the book, he uh, anticipates the inverse cascade in 2D turbulence with this quote, there will gradually emerge a few strong isolated vortices and vortices of the same sign will continue to tend to group together as confirmed by the computational study of McWilliams, another famous paper in JFM in, uh, well, much later in 1984. And uh, Batchelor in that same quote goes on to say, um, uh, where is it? The differences, yeah, here, grouped together. The differences, between this motion and three-dimensional turbulence are very great, obviously. Um, but the above argument suggests they have in common the property that the fluctuations in the velocity derivatives tend to occur in confined regions of space. Well, I mean, again, this showed great prescience uh, and is a topic that we heard much more detail from from uh, Beranger just yesterday. Um, this uh, forecasting uh, two-dimensional turbulence, I believe that he must have discussed it, the problem with Craigton at the 1961 Marseille meeting. Certainly, um, Bachelor <coughs> got a research student in uh, the 1960s, Roger Bray, to, uh, to do some very rudimentary computational work. It had to be rudimentary given the computers available in those days, uh, but on this was on two-dimensional turbulence. Um, Craignan published a paper in 1967. Actually, it's his most cited paper, which is really quite uh, remarkable. Something like 3,000 citations of this paper, Inertial Ranges in Two-Dimensional Turbulence, in which in the opening, in the introduction, he cites Bachelor 1953, page 186, the last page of the volume. And uh, I won't uh, tell you, but he's uh, talking really about the, both the uh, cascade of entropy um, towards high wave numbers and a simultaneous inverse cascade of energy towards low wa wave numbers, which really corresponds to the, what you have in the 2D situation, the merging of vortices. And both, this is Bachelor's 
uh, paper in 1969, two years later, referring to the work of Roger Bray, um, and uh, which uh, appeared only in his uh, dissertation, I think. And, um, um, and well, uh, em emphasizing particularly the form of the uh, vorticity spectrum, <coughs> the k to the minus one uh, spectrum that he obtained uh, in terms of simple entropy cascade ideas. Well, um, how am I doing? Um, Batchelor's research group in the 1950s grew very rapidly. This was 1952. <clears throat> this was 1955. Um, you can see in the little notebook that uh, some of you should have received through the uh, mail. That's this uh, notebook that was produced um, just within the last few weeks, notes from the um, uh, notes on the uh, fluid mechanics in the spirit of G.K. Batchelor. Um, well, all these no names are spelt out there, but uh, I would simply single out uh, some of them in the front row. Well, firstly on the left, this is Ian Proudman. Um, this is Bill Reed, and there's the famous paper of uh, Proudman and Reed, which emerged from that year, two years later, in Phil Trans of the Royal Society. And here, of course, is G.I. Taylor and George Batchelor. And here they are again, Taylor and Batchelor. And in the front row, this is Tom Ellison, who was quite prominent at that time, um, Alan Townsend, and on the uh, other side, Fritz Ursel, famous for his work on wave theory, a refugee, from, in fact, from Nazi Germany, and uh, Milton van Dyck, who was a visitor during that year. And behind you can spot Owen Phillips, who had come from Australia. In fact, there are three Australians uh, that you can spot in this picture. There's Bruce Morton, I think, here, uh, Owen Phillips, and Stuart Turner up here. And um, here in the middle of the back row is Philip Safman. Another famous paper is Safman and Taylor. Safman was supervised partly by Batchelor, partly by Taylor during his time as a research student, and uh, uh, several famous papers emerged from Safman during that period. Uh, so it was a great time, and I'll just mention that what was very important was the uh, range of senior visitors that Batchelor managed to attract to uh, Cambridge during the 50s and very early 60s. From the USA, we have Bill Reed, as I've said, Milton Van Dyke, very important. Chia Shun Yi, who was already at Ann Arbor, came uh, for a year, again around 1960. I remember that visit well. Andy Akravos, who came also around 1960 and many times in uh, over the subsequent decades. Uh, very familiar and welcome visitor to Cambridge, and he held a <coughs> visiting fellowship at Clare Hall during his visits. Uh, from uh, Australia, well, I've mentioned Alan Townsend, Bruce Morton, Owen Phillips, Stuart Turner, and Adrian Gill, very important, came in 1960. He came via the um, Streza Congress uh, of Applied Mechanics, um, um, which I attended also, and uh, that's where I met Adrian Gill for the first time. He was on his way to Cambridge and took Streza as a convenient stopping off point. Uh, from Poland, I've mentioned Herczynski and uh, Vladik Fishin. From Japan, Tomomasa Tatsumi, remarkably, was able to come in 1955. I think he was the first um, Japanese visitor to Cambridge, maybe not the first, but certainly the first to our department. He came the same year as Hisashi Owada, who is now an honorary fellow of Trinity College. He's a lawyer, famous uh, lawyer. Um, uh, they came in 1955, first visitors from Japan to Cambridge in the post-war years. <clears throat> Tomomasa was working then on the closure problem of turbulence and is still actively engaged in this field to this day. Um, a remarkable example of endurance on an, what many would regard as an impossibly difficult problem. Now I come back to Kolmogorov 1961, his refinement of previous hypotheses. And um, this was just the beginning of the paper. There was no abstract, he just plunged, plunged <coughs> straight into the argument. 
uh, George asked me to, I was very uh, much a novice, but uh, I claimed to have a rudimentary knowledge of Russian, uh, which was really uh, uh, not the case. But anyway, George asked me to, um, to copy edit this paper, which had been translated uh, to rather non-scientific English uh, uh, from Russian to, as I say, non-scientific English. So it was quite a, uh, a difficult task copy editing it. But anyway, if you find any errors or infelicities of style in that paper, you can actually blame me. This uh, paper, well, it, it's what got me hooked in uh, JFM. I was a, an assistant editor <clears throat> until um, 1966. And then uh, George invited me to join him as an editor of the journal, which I was until 1983 when I retired from that position. We were very lucky that George himself was willing and able to continue as an editor and then foundation editor until his death in uh, 2000. Um, this was the beginning of JFM, 1956. Uh, I repeat this from volume one, part one, May 1956. The Journal of Fluid Mechanics exists for the publication of theoretical and experimental investigation of all aspects of the mechanics of fluids and is issued in six parts per volume. Here's the editor, then at the Cavendish Laboratory, although in fact he was a lecturer in the uh, Faculty of Mathematics, and uh, three associate editors, James Lighthill here, Wayland Griffith from Princeton, and um, George Carrier from Harvard University. And there were two assistant editors, Ian Proudman and Brooke Benjamin. The average age of this team was 33. So uh, you might say a very remarkable achievement from a very young team. Batcher himself was 36 at uh, this time when the journal was founded. And it was obviously under his impetus that the journal took off and took off to a very good start. The same year, there was the Brussels Congress of, uh, well, it's now called Theoretical and Applied Mechanics. It was, I think, still just the Congress of Applied Mechanics at that time. Um, Brussels, this is an interesting photo because you see Batchelor here and uh, Lighthill on the right. It's the only photo that I have <coughs> that has both Batchelor and Lighthill in it together, which is remarkable. Uh, there were two dominant figures in fluid mechanics, but actually poles apart in personality and style. Lighthill held the Lucasian chair uh, in DAMTP from 1969 to 78. Uh, again, it was a, a, a wonderful period for fluid mechanics and uh, Lighthill and Batchelor got on extremely well, apart from their, as I say, extremely divergent personalities. This is another photograph from the same Congress. I think this was the Congress committee of the, uh, uh, of the Brussels meeting uh, on which Batchelor served. And the only other person I recognize on this is uh, Sidov, who represented the Soviet Union on that committee and was a very regular um, member of the Bureau for at least two de decades after this um, occasion, perhaps three. Um, okay, uh, I think I'll skip this one because time is short uh, and show you the premises of DAMTP, which many of you will remember in Silver Street, uh, which were our premises from 64 to the year 2000. George sat at first floor in an office on the right hand side of the building here and he used to keep an eye on um, all the parking arrangements in the courtyard here and make sure, sure that nobody was parked illegally or without due attention to space. <laughs> he was uh, uh, certainly a man uh, who paid great attention to detail as Howard mentioned. So in 67 his famous book Fluid Dynamics, uh, an introduction to fluid dynamics was published by CUP. These are little notes. I have the author's copy, his own personal copy. Actually, this is the 
the second edition, 1970, <clears throat> but it's full of little notes of this kind, further corrections that he intended to include in the subsequent versions. And I say with a sigh of relief, he headed off on his bicycle, which he always used at that time, um, with the manuscript of uh, this book in his case, he headed off for Cambridge University Press, which was the uh, Pitt Press building just uh, adjacent on Trumpington Street, adjacent to the um, department. I say this book, textbook that now ranks with Lamb's hydrodynamics as one of the great classics of the subject, <clears throat> soon to establish itself as the Bible of the subject for advanced university courses. Well, um, here I've jumped to um, uh, much later and I'm skipping the years of micro hydrodynamics because that's um, much more our chairman's area than mine. But um, here is uh, the group photo taken in um, at uh, George's 70th birthday celebration in the department common room um, in March 1990. Um, and this is a special volume of JFN that was published containing the papers written by this group. Brooke Benjamin here, Yaglom, Akiva Yaglom, um, Owen Phillips, Andy Akravos, who's still, I'm very glad to say he's probably here attending this, this uh, Zoom meeting. Um, Grisha Barenblatt behind, who became uh, uh, G.I. Taylor Professor of Fluid Mechanics, uh, a year or two later, um, George, of course, myself, Milton Van Dyke, who was able to come for this meeting, and Philip Safman, who all came together for this meeting and all contributed papers to this special volume. Um, I like to compare Bachelor with uh, Stokes. <clears throat> There's al almost exactly a hundred years between them, but there are many points of similarity. Uh, as I point out here, uh, Bachelor spent more, nearly all his career in Cambridge from 1940, uh, when well, he was a lecturer from 48 and uh, uh, emeritus professor till the year 2000. Stokes, Lucasian professor, 1849 to 1897, and he lived into the uh, 20th century. He was master of Pembroke College in his final years. Uh, both men were what I would say is uh, supremely conscientious, with strong personal commitment to the essential morality of science, as we've seen from the quotation that Howard uh, ended his lecture with. Both made seminal contributions to fluid mechanics, in Bachelor's case to the theory of homogeneous turbulence and later to microhydrodynamics. Appropriately, the application of Stokes's theory to suspensions of particles, drops, or bubbles in fluids. So again, a very strong link between the two. Um, this is the portrait that you've seen in several of the uh, um, lectures uh, by Rupert Shepherd, uh, done a year after George's retirement in 1983. Um, uh, the portrait done just within one year after that. Well, there I think I should stop and give others a chance perhaps to raise questions or make their own comments. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Thank you, Keith. I, perhaps could I just a couple of observations myself of George's um, style or spirit. Um, I was a research student myself with George and <clears throat> he, he, he didn't have organized weekly meetings that uh, if you didn't do anything, you, he didn't come around to see what you were up to. Um, on the other hand, if you were excited by some new result, you could walk up to his office door and um, uh, knock on it, and he would make time there and then to listen to you. Uh, with one exception, four o'clock. Four o'clock he signed the letters that he had dictated during the day, something we don't do these days. Um, uh, he wouldn't see you then, but otherwise he would see you and listen very carefully and make suggestions. And then he would end, I don't quite see that, some particular point. Of course, you knew that meant you were totally wrong on that. 
but it was such a kind way of saying so. <laughs> the other thing I'd say about, uh, should comment on, is his writing style, which uh, others have already mentioned. Um, in the summer before I came up to do my PhD, I thought it was a, probably a good idea if I read his textbook, uh, which had only been published a couple of years earlier. So I did read it from cover to cover. And I made two resolutions on having read that. One, there was no way that I could ever construct his long sentences, very, very long sentences. Mm -hmm. I think one goes on for about a third of a page. Mm -hmm. That would never be my style. But the other feature I would adopt, would attempt to adopt, was his style of explaining things. If he wrote down an equation, he'd first tell you why he was going to write it down and what it involved. When he'd written it down and made some uh, little maneuver, he would tell you what he'd achieved and what was the significance of it. What did, the, uh, what did it say and what did it mean? And in George's writing, there are always more words than mathematics. <laughs> in other words, there's always more thought than mathematics. And I attempt to do that. I, I think I've made uh, my point. I'll just read it. May I make a comment on George's ability, especially given two of the people involved today. He hired to tenured positions two people while still graduate students, Keith Moffat and John Hinch. He appointed no other people like that. He was right twice out of two times, as always. If I'd have read that, I wouldn't have invited you to say anything. That's embarrassing. <laughs> the truth hurts, does it, John? <laughs> and thank you anyway, Herbert. <laughs> I could make a comment uh, following your uh, comment, uh, John. Uh, I, <clears throat> you remember we had a little meeting to plant trees uh, from Australia <laughs> in, uh, uh, in a little garden devoted to George outside the department and I composed a little poem uh, on that occasion which I can recite to you here because it chimes exactly with what you just said. Uh, I don't quite understand, he used to say, <clears throat> in questing a tone to which we lent our ears at Friday seminars in the old room A, the ones <clears throat> he'd never missed in 50 years. I don't quite understand your line of thought that leads you to these curves of rising slope, which fail to go to zero as they ought. Perhaps you've lost a sign, or so I hope. The speaker <coughs> blanched and halted in his tracks, would stammer, well, I, I hadn't noticed that, thinking, oh God, my theory's full of cracks. Let's leave these curves for later private chat. So then would GK be, with patient tact, convey the insight that the treatment lacked? Very good. It's a comment from me, actually, John, and it follows from what you were saying. I remember once refereeing a paper for George, JFM, which I thought could from benefit from a little bit more of a mathematical treatment. And I think George spoke to me on the phone rather than that. He said, oh, yes, thank you for your comment. Yes, I agree. But, you know, sometimes you can have too much mathematics. <laughs> well, very good. I think we should um, uh, wrap up now. And Paul, I believe you want to say something now. Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, and thank you, uh, Keith and Howard and uh, Zhang Zhang for their talks today and also the other speakers on the previous days. I think this has been an excellent uh, three days. Of course, it wasn't what we wanted to do. Um, and uh, we hope that we would all be able to meet uh, in person, uh, but that hasn't been, hasn't been possible. But uh, I would like to say a couple of things. One is that uh, this is not the end of this meeting and that we will have, uh, in the spirit of the Damp to Friday seminars, uh, seminars every Friday uh, for the eight weeks starting at the end of April, 
for the early career researchers who were going to speak at the meeting had been held in person and had we been able to run for the full three days. So uh, please, uh, there'll be announcements about these in the usual way. And so please, uh, I hope you'll enjoy uh, hearing from them. Uh, there is also, of course, the uh, commemorative volume of Journal of Fluid Mechanics, volume 914, which has recently been uh, published. Um, and uh, uh, I was pleased to see that uh, Howard read out the quote from George uh, from Applied Mechanics Reviews, which I also included in my notes in that, uh, in that journal, because I think it is a very important message and one that I'm very pleased to see that we've had both an international uh, set of speakers and international audience. And I'd like to thank all of them and all of you uh, for that attendance. Just one thing I'd like to add personally about George, which hasn't received very much mention, although Ray did say something about it at the beginning, is that uh, he in the area of fluid mechanics, when he established the department, he established the laboratory uh, the Fluid Mechanics Laboratory, now named in his honor, the GK Bachelor Laboratory, um, uh, which uh, I had the privilege of being the director of uh, for uh, about 20 years um, and is now ably led uh, by Stuart DL um, and uh, is still a vibrant place for fluid mechanics research. And it was pleasing and, and I think not entirely intentional when we made the invitations that every one of the speakers uh, today referred to uh, over the last three days has referred to laboratory experiments uh, as well as theoretical modeling, mathematical modeling and uh, computation. And I think this combination of, uh, of experimental work along with uh, advanced computation has really advanced the field. Um, as uh, Detlef mentioned yesterday, things that are possible now just were not possible uh, when George was in his heyday, um, the ability to measure uh, flow fields and at high speeds have really revolutionized the subject. And I think it's a great, another great example of George Batchelor's foresight that he saw that it's really important to, to um, anchor research in fluid mechanics around things you can actually see and measure. Um, and that was one of his great strengths, as, as Keith has pointed out, uh, encouraging Alan Townsend to come with him because he realized, I think, even at that stage that these points were inseparable. So I'd, so I'd like to thank again uh, all the support we've had from my UTAM and Euromec, uh, from Trinity College and from Cambridge University Press. I'd particularly like to thank Kathleen too, who uh, is the Cambridge University Press person involved with uh, Journal of Fluid Mechanics and Flow for her personal input throughout this whole process. Uh, Cambridge University Press have also kindly uh, donated uh, 250 travel mugs, unfortunately dated 2020 because we were planning to have the meeting in 2020. I put a message in the chat just now that if you would like one of these travel mugs, please send an email to gkb100 at maths.cam.ac.uk. Uh, and on a first come first serve basis and through the generosity of the department, we will mail you out a travel mag, a mug. And uh, hopefully at some point you'll actually be able to travel with it and use it uh, uh, sometime in the future. So with that, I think I'd just like to close. Uh, I'd like it, again to thank all our speakers for fantastic lectures. These are all recorded and will be available through the Cambridge University Press website. Um, uh, so if you've missed one or would like to revisit one, please, uh, that, that will be there. Um, and uh, papers associated with the talks uh, have been given free access uh, until the end of June uh, this year. So you'll be able to find those too. And with that, I'd just like to say, I hope that uh, uh, if George uh, uh, is looking from somewhere that he was pleased with this meeting. Um, and uh, I'm sure that it's been an inspiration to, to all of us uh, to see the influence that such a, a brilliant person can have on a subject. And with that, I'll say thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>